Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 683. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 1st, 2021. Three, two, one. All right, welcome to... No, it's not our Monday show or our Tuesday show. We had to push off to Wednesday. We didn't even do a Friday show. <laughs> oh, my God. And there's been so much news since then. So we got lots of news to cover, George. Uh, you've been doing a little traveling. Uh, welcome back to your house in Florida. Yes, I was in Atlanta the last two days, and last week I had pneumonia. And so I've been, uh, I was in bed for a few days, staring at the walls, and and uh, we went up to see our ch- one of our children up in Atlanta, and now we're back and all set to kick off a new month. Oh, that's good. Uh, we used to be, uh, just a couple days ago, let me pull up the map here. Uh, yesterday we were in Washington Island, and people have been asking me to uh, point this out to them. So as you can see, this is the Midwest of the U.S., and if you go down here far enough, off the tip of the peninsula here in Wisconsin, there's a gap. There's water. I went to Washington Island, which can only be reached by ferry, and uh, we were there for camping. We happened to be there at the same time as the Washington Island. Uh, it's called uh, Death by Barbecue. Jill? No. What was it Death's called? Door Death's Door Barbecue. <laughs> the the peninsula, the, the water between the the island and the uh, uh, peninsula is called Death's Door because of the current. If you try to traverse it by canoe or a kayak, it takes you out to the sea, or out to sea, out to Lake uh, Michigan, and uh, you, you're lost forever. So, uh, had a lot of fun there, and now we're down in Fond du Lac uh, as we head back to Madison. So that's the the travels here of Monstro George. We should hit the news. Let me bring up my story list. Lots of stories. Good news story. We've had lots of, <laughs> we don't to find lots of good news stories. Now people are making it for us. The Diocese of Fort Worth is going to receive compensation for court cost in effect of $4.5 million uh, for their last 10 years of fighting the Episcopal Church, George. Yes, the diocese press spokesperson, Suzanne Gill, announced that the check cleared from 8.15 last, er, last week. And so they've got the money uh, reimbursed for their costs for all this litigation over the last seven, eight years. So, th- and this is wonderful news. It puts a final end to the whole Fort Worth uh, litigation saga. And it allows the diocese to go back and reinvest and reinvent itself uh, away from all the problems of the past, of the legal challenges. Now, people have asked, has the, anything been decided on the churches that have been stripped naked bare from uh, after they were turned over? We don't know the answer to that question. But I think the four and a half million dollars in the bank, uh, that takes away some, but not all the sting. It's... You know, we've watched the saga in Texas and South Carolina, uh, California, other places for so long to finally see the um, Diocese of Texas go to the Texas Supreme Court, have neutral principles enforced by the Supreme Court, allowing them to keep their property was wonderful. The fact that they had to pay to go through all this misery over the last 10 years was horrible to watch to have them reimbursed for all those expenses, uh, all the lawyers, all the fighting, all the appeals and fighting appeals and appeals and appeals and appeals, there's finally been resolution. And we, we have not seen this in so many court cases, George. That's, that's absolutely correct, Kevin. This one is finally done. It's been uh, marked paid in full. Mm-hmm. And one of the things people may say, 4.5 million, that's extraordinary. Well having been involved on the periphery of these cases across many dioceses and states, this is on the low side. The mm-hmm. lawyers in Fort Worth did not, I'm fairly confident to say that they did not charge for every single thing that they gave them concessionary prices. They actually did stuff for free from time to time. Mm-hmm. So the 4.5 million is actually a low figure because the diocese 
receive support from the legal community. For instance, Alan Haley offered his support over the years, and he was never compensated. Whereas in the Episcopal Church, uh, uh, Alan Haley re reports that a review of their paperwork shows they spent fifty million, $51 million on the litigation. And what people never sort of uh, cotton on to, Alan points out, is that the partner at this law firm that received the $51 million is David Booth Beers, the chancellor of the Episcopal Church. So the guy who sets the lawsuits in motion sends the work to his par to his law firm. And as a partner, he gets some of the proceeds from the work he's, he's uh, instigating. It adds equity to the law firm, which he is a partner in, correct. And, and so the... Uh, you know, the difference is the Episcopal law firms all charge for every paperclip, every cup of coffee, every secretary's run to get more supplies, whereas well, the diocesan lawsuits have to, had to be very trim. The diocese, diocese didn't pay many of their expert witnesses. The diocese did do this, whereas um, the uh, I know for a certain fact that the uh, professor of history at uh, General Theological Seminary, who was an ex expert witness in several for the Episcopal Church in several cases, received hundreds of thousands of dollars in compensation for his expert testimony. Whereas other experts on the other side received nothing or an honorarium. Or a plane ticket. You know, yeah. it was, it, it's completely different. Now, the 51 million was just spent by 815. Mm -hmm. That does include all the diocesan cost. Uh, when a diocese, uh, fought the ACNA diocese that we're trying to uh, be competition, according to Catherine Jefford Shorey. Uh, those costs, according to Alan Haley, could have run up to, and this is a guesstimation, because the, the diocese aren't being really forthcoming with the numbers, up to $150 million. That means in the last 20 years, 21 years, the Episcopal Church, 815, and the diocese have spent $200 million dollars fighting property claims mm -hmm. wow now some of these uh some of these people had uh, litigation insurance we had that case in south carolina where the episcopal church sued the episcopal church because the church insurance company of vermont was paying the litigation insurance claims of the diocese of south carolina yeah. and the episcopal church in south carolina was furious that uh that these claims were being paid, so it wound up the Episcopal Church, this division is suing that division of the Episcopal Church, and of course they lost, <laughs> and South Carolina got some of its money back. But you know, for every dollar taken out of the witness and mission and ministry of the Episcopal Church, putting the lawyers on both sides is just so destructive to the mission of building the kingdom of God. Well, the um, New Testament tells us not to go to court against your brother. And this is why you're $200 million short now of stuff that could have been spent for the kingdom, spent for growing the church, spent for reaching people, spent for ministries uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, instead, you, you had to fight over uh, bricks and mortar. Well, the other sort of thank goodness side to this is, thank goodness we're not the Roman Catholic Church because they've spent billions on their abuse settlements and the yeah. Episcopal Church and the ACNA have not really been touched by any of that stuff. Mm -mm. But so much of the patrimony of the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church and other churches has been frittered away in lawsuits and litigation over the past uh, 25 years. And it's just so sad, okay. so, so unnecessary. It is. Times are changing, George. Now, uh, I'm going to read to you the uh, foundational statements of the Harvard School. It's interesting because it's not what they think today. The foundational statement says, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the end of his life and studies into know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of a sound knowledge and learning. That's Harvard's orig original mission statement. We learned this week that Harvard has hired an atheist to be the chaplain at Harvard. <laughs> you hear it's just, it's like, and I'm like, well, it's kind of good news, George, isn't it? 
Well, they're being honest. Uh, <laughs> the reality uh, reality is matching reality. There's no uh, hypocrisy going on. Oh. Harvard uh, replaced its university chaplain, and they hired a Jewish atheist chaplain. Now, how can you be a Jewish atheist? Well, this man was trained at a humanist uh, Jewish rabbin rabbinical seminary. So he has a seminary education, sort of like mine, in the sense that it was also humanist and atheist, except we went to different schools. Sure. But he is in charge of the spiritual well-being of the other chaplains uh, of the student body at Harvard College. And he sort of leads the chaplaincy team. So each denomination has a chaplain affiliated with the college that they can afford to send there. Um, one of the funny little things is usually this spot is for the Church of England, uh, <laughs> but uh, Harvard trumps the Church of England. But there is an English angle to this because the University of Nottingham recently told the Catholic Church that they would not allow the Catholic chaplain to be chaplain anymore because the man believed a little too much for their comfort. The Catholic chaplain at the University of Nottingham was fired because he believed that abortion was a sin and that homosexuality was not God's plan for human sexuality and that, you know, people shouldn't play around before marriage. And the university said, we can't have someone like that around our students. So, oh my. I do find the story kind of ironic because to maintain and have uh, a belief in it, it shows that atheism is a belief structure. It takes a lot of faith to be a pure atheist, uh, to, to find that uh, nothing was created, that everything was accidental, that uh, uh, all beauty is uh, grossly ugly. And, you know, that takes a lot of faith, which means this gentleman has more faith than most of the chaplains in the last 20 or 30 years at uh, Harvard. So, you know, it, it is ironic. They got, they got a person with more faith in something less, le more trivial. So, <sighs> but it, it also speaks to the death of the institutions in American society. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There was one time when being a chaplain, being the chaplain of Harvard or the chaplain of Yale, for instance, was considered a national position, a position of national national pride and prestige. So during the Vietnam War, when the when the chaplain at the Yale University would go march in student protests. That made the news, and his condemnation of the war in Vietnam was treated as a real moral statement. Now, who cares what this man says about any issue? Yeah. And what it says is that the currency of the great universities and the great institutions has been so debased and devalued over the past 20, 30, 40 years that they're essentially the institutions, uh, the great institutions, be it the church, the press, uh, the religious denominations, government, have no meaning. The courts, they're held in low regard. In this very state. low regard. Uh, I mean, there's a famous quote that wherever you find trouble, you find a Harvard grad. So, <laughs> just like, now it's even worse. George, let's move on. we got lots of stories to cover because we had a couple of days off. Uh, next story, uh, Church of Wales is going to discuss, vote, and clearly, I, I guarantee you, approve uh, same-sex blessings and marriages in their province, George. The Church in Wales is governing body, which is their name for their synod, meets this month of September. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues they will take up are same-sex blessings, whether clergy are allowed to bless or solemnize same-sex unions. Uh, gay marriage is legal in Wales, and the uh, though the Church in Wales is not established, they follow in that establishment tradition of trying to basically accommodate the culture. And this is not really a surprise because the Church in Wales is, has been on the very liberal end. They have a non-celibate lesbian uh, bishop in Monmouth. Uh, they, this is the church where they had the woman bishop out in St. David's who denounced the conservative party it, with really heated, evil, political, partisan tones. Um, I don't mean to pick it. There are good and faithful and true members of the church in Wales, faithful clergy, but their management, their leadership structure is just so woke. Yeah. They're, they're, that you know, bishops are appointed 
based on gender, based on sexuality. So we have to have, we have six bishops, we need to have three male, three female. Um, we have one les, we have one not lesbian, and I'm just waiting for the next, you know, black lesbian in a wheelchair uh, appointed as a bishop in Wales, not because of her merits, but because of her victim status. Sure. No, it, I know that I know that's offensive to some people, but that's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. And when you look at the quality and caliber of these people they brought on board, the church in Wales is not a high flyer by any standard. Well, one of the things we've always done, and I think it's a mistake, is we've judged the church and we've judged, judged governments and societies and policies by their intentions, mm -hmm. where we need to be judging them by the results. And when you judge uh, the Church of Wales by its results, you, or the Church of England, uh, <laughs> the government policies of the last you know hundred years, uh, the intentions are not getting the results they want. In the church lectionary on Sunday, we had from the epistle reading that passage from James, "Be doers of the word," mm -hmm. and that doing the word of God is the mark of being a Christian, not just talking about it but doing it, and you can look at the Church in Wales and the Church of England and you ask yourselves, are any of these bishops doers of the word? We've, and there's recent publication of a report uh, from a coroner in the London about a, a priest who committed suicide after he was basically in some sort of Kafka-esque investigation of alleged child abuse, which he didn't do. And the coroner just absolutely denounce the indifference, the cruelty, the bureaucratic inertia of the Church of England. And the Church of England issued its response and report, and it basically said the same things we always hear, lessons will be learned, but nobody has taken responsibility. Has the Bishop of London, who in essence is supposed to be the person where the buck stops, acknowledged responsibility? No. Now, granted, she was not the person who made the mistakes, but she ran the show and has done nothing to discipline those who made the mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a culture of, in the, the Episcopacy in England and Wales, and in the United States and many, many dioceses of both the Episcopal Church and, I'm sad to say, in the ACNA, of bishops who were there because they like to be bishops, not because they're fathers in God or have a charism for it, but they've climbed the greasy pole and finally reached the pinnacle of their professional success. Yeah, when the church says lessons will be learned, it's it's really a lie from the pit of hell. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just, no, we're going to push this and move on, and we hope it doesn't bite us again. Well, the problem is it's not biting you, it's biting your, your congregants and laity and the very image of Christ that you're trying to present. So... Okay. Oh, next story, George. Uh, quick update on the uh, Upper Midwest, the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. Uh, there was a press release saying they want to expand the investigation. Now, normally when you and I cover stories around the world about churches doing investigations uh, about malfeasance or something that didn't happen right or uh, parties that have been hurt, you don't see they want to expand it. They want to narrow it and kind of push it off to the side. To the ACNA's credit, I think they found a sm smoking gun here, and they're saying, listen, we need to open this up more, and we're going to do a very thorough investigation, George. The executive committee of the ACNA met this past uh, weekend and received a request by the people running the investigation of the Upper Midwest Diocese, which is looking at how a an abuse scandal uh, was handled both on the parochial level and by the church diocese and staff and the bishop. Now, if you're an American and you watch politics and you hear that uh, an investigation in Congress, they want to expand the scope of the investigation, what that usually means is they found nothing, but they still want to get their enemy, whether it's President Trump or whoever it is. Mm -hmm. So they want to ask, Let's keep looking till we find something, even though we're no longer tied to the original complaint. We're going to get Kissinger somehow. <laughs> In this sense, the, 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 the investigatory body has come back to the executive council and said, look, we need to expand the scope. 
which means they've found something mm. which is main which is related to and should be they should be given the authority to go further in so what i want to say is i salute the acna leadership for its transparency and for its ability to basically root out any evil or corruption it may find i'm not saying there is but if there is this is how you do it correctly mm -hmm. not by not by closing your eyes and make it hoping it'll go away so we i have no inside knowledge as to what this may be frankly i don't want to know yeah, until know. until such time as it can be said this is what happened mm -hmm. because you this whole upper midwest saga started off with so much hyperbole and misinformation that it was there was something there but it was hard to say what it was because the claims were so outrageous yeah i mean it, it's one of those things where as journalists and news people we, we, what is the real story here and you can't get the story when all you have is people shouting at each other on twitter Mm -hmm. You know, you can't dive into this type of layered story uh, by following social media. You really have to uh, have the each people, each person put out statements as to what they believe happened. And this investigation will go a long way to helping us discover where errors were made, what can be corrected, and who's at fault, and who's going to uh, be punished for it. So, you know, we'll have to wait this one out. Uh I've been vaxxed, you've been vaxxed, and we had a discussion in pre-show that, you know, we trust the, the science enough to get vaxxed uh, because in our duties as lay people and clergy, we want to have access to the people uh, being safe to them and safe to ourselves in COVID times. Kevin, I, I need to correct a small error. Okay. I am vaxxed because my daughter, the nurse, made me get vaxxed. <laughs> and I said vaxxed. I'm double vaxxed. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I mean, we, we wanted to escape Florida and do traveling the summer. That's primarily why we got vaxxed. Uh, and we, we got vaxxed as soon as possible, finding the nearest CVS that would do it for, I, I turned 55 just in time so that I could get my 55 year old uh, CVS shot and we got to travel and um, you got to go next door to McDonald's to get your 55 cent <laughs> cup of coffee yes and so you know we we did it for uh, ministry and selfish purposes to travel we didn't want to uh, get stuck in uh, a place where we couldn't get into or get out of because we didn't have a vaccination card I can't go to Grace Cathedral in San Francisco George because I don't have uh, a copy to give them on my vaccination card. It's in a safe in the back of Monstro. So if I showed up there and they said, uh, Mr. Carlson, welcome to the 1030 service where we're going to worship whatever pagan god they worship there. Um, where is your vax card? <laughs> and I go, hi, ah, what? Why do I need a vaccination card to go to an Episcopal Cathedral now, George? Where do because they have the authority to do this? Because it's San Francisco. Yes. Uh, they are claiming that the San Francisco Board of Health, they're just following the recommendations. San Francisco is one of the more woke uh, places on earth. No, it is the most woke place on earth. <laughs> well, I have a daughter in San Francisco and one in Seattle, so I need to say that each has each leads in its particular areas. And then, of course, there's Portland in between. But the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco is reopening, and they're now asking that you show your papers uh, this has all the rings of bad spy novel that uh, you must show your papers uh, to the police. Uh, you know, produce your papers, please. And they look at you and all this and that. Are you vaxxed? That well, they like it, they they believe that it is. Uh, they they're the theologizing it by saying by having vaccination papers, you share your commitment to the social justice and concerns for others that you're not getting them sick. Mm -hmm. Now, on one level, I think that's worthy and noteworthy. But for instance, I have a uh, number of parishioners who are cancer patients on chemotherapy. They're not getting vexed because they have no immune system. Right. If you take interferon, it wipes out your immune system so you can take better chemotherapy. 
Now, do I tell these people where I to have to implement this policy? No, you may not come to church anymore unless you show them your papers. Mm -hmm. And in other words, there are medical exemptions. There are, there's one member of my congregation who was quite incensed because they believe that the vaccines are made from the uh, embryo fetuses, uh, embryos from aborted, aborted fetuses. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough to be able to say she's right or she's wrong. But for me, that I hear her offering an issue of conscience. I may not agree with her, but I cannot say to her, you know, the Lord hates you and you may not partake of the sacraments because you hold a position you believe has moral integrity. Uh, these blanket rules, I just think are mistaken. Uh, well, we just mentioned in the cathedral, now there's dioceses that are requiring their clergy to be vexed as well, George. It's sort of funny. The diocese that for years would say, well, clergy need to have the freedom to celebrate same-sex marriages, to do this or that. These are the dioceses that are mandating the clergy get vaccines. So far, Maine and Long Island, two on the liberal side. Maine has a non-celibate uh, gay bishop, for instance, mm -hmm. are mandating its clergy. They must do this, whereas conforming to the Constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church has always been optional in Maine and Long Island, so long as it's airs on the side of the liberal agenda. So all clergy and all church staff in these two dioceses, and it's being laid out as a public health necessity. And I'm sympathetic to that, but at the same time, I bridle when things are made mandatory and I when there's no exemption or no allowance for personal conscience and that's and i do too i i prefer that people get their smallpox vaccine i prefer the polio i prefer that they get their COVID. i do not prefer that i'm able to force you to do it remember when we had to, when we went to tanzania you were up in connecticut i was oh in God. florida oh and God. we were i mean how many shots do we have to get yellow fever uh, dengue fever, yeah. malaria everything. pills all mm -hmm. these things now and in fact we had a uh I had a little yellow fever vax, a little yellow fever mm -hmm. World Health Organization passport to show that I had the yellow fever shots. Yeah. The, which, because it, some nations, unless you can't produce this at the border, they won't let you in. And at the time, I had no problem with that. But I guess maybe I'm too politicized, but I do have a problem of having to show your vaccine passport to get into, oh, uh, a. In New York City now, you need to show your vaccine pass to get into restaurants. Yeah. You know, if Gov if Mayor de Blasio hasn't destroyed the economy of that great city by now, this is his last chance to do so because this is just another death blow to the restaurant industry, to the theater industry, to the what makes New York a wonderful, fun place to visit. I mean. You, when you guys were up in Connecticut, every other weekend it seemed that you and Jill and the, oh. your kids were going down to see a show or to do something. No, New York City was a wonderful place, uh, probably since the mid '90s on. Uh, they really cleaned it up. Uh, it has now gone to, and I'm going to use the word pot. Um, the, the violence going on there in the streets, the breakdown in the society, and the uh, legal system is just amazing to watch. I have friends there. Uh, and I communicate with them and I see the reports where uh, New York City, Lower Manhattan and all that has been evacuated by small businesses that can now work remotely. Uh, and so those businesses that relied on those people to come in and uh, eat at their luncheons and restaurants and delis, nothing. The deli cart people, the guy who sold the pretzel that was probably three days old and the hot dog that had the, the, the stale ketchup. He can't support himself anymore because there's not that traffic on the streets in, in lower Manhattan anymore. And this is part of what COVID did and is doing. And we look to our leaders to make it better so people will return uh, post-COVID. The churches are better. Your church is starting to grow again post-COVID. My church is at full strength post-COVID. And so why can't we do that in our cities, in our states? And one of the things that is so amazing is that these uh, these cities are all controlled by the same political party with the same political agenda. The primary victims are the poor. My Seattle, my San Francisco mm -hmm. daughter says that the 
in San Francisco where you can watch Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram have these shows about how, you know, their feces and drug needles on the streets and there's crime rampant everywhere and the police don't arrest you unless you've stolen over a thousand dollars worth of goods. Laura says that in San Francisco, the higher you go in the city, the lower the crime. So if you're up on Knob Hill, if you're in the wealthy, nice places, not down in the uh, city itself, you don't see this stuff hmm. because the hobos are sort of shooed away by uh, security guards in front of your building. And the wealthy are not being affected in their gated communities, in their exclusive parts of town. But if you live uh, it, the, the Upper East Side is not in the middle of a murder uh, or shooting rampage. But Bedford Stuyvesant it is, yeah. and the South Bronx is. In Brooklyn. It's, al it's right. always the poor who suffer from these collectivist policies. The, the all, they're almost always initiated in their name, but the end, it's, it's like the minimum wage. And when you raise the minimum wage, you're not making, you're actually making people poor because prices rise to match the minimum wage. Inflation. Uh, for yeah. the, the local McDonald's here in Fond du Lac, Twenty dollars an hour to start uh, for McDonald's, not bad. I'm at a campground uh, where they have this big municipal pool uh, where all the kids come every summer. There's slides, there's Olympic-sized pools and venues for a place to send your kids here in Fond du Lac. They can't get lifeguards. The pool has been closed all summer. It was so. This is the second year in a row. Because nobody wants to work here in Wisconsin, they still get the federal dough, so they're they're getting more money not working than they would working at minimum wage, but that causes inflation and hyperinflation. Uh, I think next week you and I should talk about what's happening in China as China is starting to tackle the hyperinflation they're having uh, or hypo hypercapitalism they're having. Um, it's just crazy. Well. So. You're right, Kevin, but I wouldn't call it hyper capitalism. It's hyper hyper mercantilism. Yes, state state driven capitalism. Yeah. Kevin and I, as you've no doubt uh, have figured out, are proponents of Austrian economic theory, uh, laissez faire economics. We have Jesus Christ and Milton Friedman on our altars. <laughs> I'm being silly. No, <laughs> but 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 here's the, th the thing: is that all these things that we learned in school or that we've learned through experience in the business world are being shown to be true by government policies uh, across the board, whether it's unemployment insurance or it's closures or it's it's making things very difficult. Well, what I have not seen yet is the socialist liberal side of the American ethos stand up and say, wait a minute. You know, for every uh, cause out there, there's a place where you can have that cause celebrated and uh, taken on by somebody in the, in in liberalism. When we uh, had, and they always have been called, illegal aliens in this country, uh, people who come across the border and didn't get their visas or green cards or whatever, um, they now have sanctuary cities to go to. San Francisco is one of them. Seattle, Portland, uh, a lot of West Coast uh, cities allow... Uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Uh, sanctuary cities where you can go and not be prosecuted because you're an illegal alien here in, uh, inside the American boundaries without correct papers. Could there be a sanctuary city for the unvaxxed? Or a sanctuary church. Can't I go to the cathedral in San Francisco, knock on the door, sanctuary? I am not vexed. Why can't I do that? Oh well, when we make the film, I want you to have Charlton Heston play the. Uh, <laughs> I'm not vexed. You know, silent green is people. Oh, oh man. My. All right, last story. I got criticism last week for talking about Afghanistan. And guess what? It happened. It it fell. Who criticized you, Kevin? I oh, mean, there's some people out there. It's okay. A couple was, emails. I mean, come on now. It's <laughs> so. What you? I mean, <laughs> next they're going to criticize you for saying the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Uh, I mean, so uh, you, <sighs> Afghanistan clearly a vacuum. See, here's, here's the difference okay, between Kevin and George. 
Kevin gets criticized over his Afghanistan policy views. I get criticized for making fun of a bishop's dumb haircut. <laughs> so, well, he's got my haircut. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it is interesting. Um, people forget there's so much evil in this world, and uh, it exists everywhere here in America, uh, on both sides of all political parties. Um, inside, outside the church, and there's darker, deeper places of evil, and we find that in Afghanistan and in some of these um, radical Islamic countries. And Afghanistan has always been a vacuum. When you go into it, you're there only with the support you have there the whole time. We had to take our army in there and basically leave our army there for 20 years. With the cod you know codfish that hey we're we're training their army and one day they'll be able to uh be able to protect their own freedom the reality is so many other countries across the world don't understand freedom as we as americans or westerners understand freedom they don't understand it's worth fighting for and protecting and it's just not part of their makeup america is founded by people who were the pilgrims and the frontiersmen who had a nickel in their pocket and hopped on a ship and came to uh, find something new. You don't find that with the people left over in the Middle East in these countries. They have a different ethos and understanding of family, of religion, of what's important and what to fight for. And you can't force freedom on uh, these countries. You can kind of convince them, hey, we got something better. Can we show it to you? But... 20 years later, um, ouch, we, we've hurt ourselves. The Soviet Union went in there. They hurt themselves. The Brits were in there. They hurt themselves. And there's no way in a thousand books you could ever understand um, how to change Afghanistan. It, it's not changeable. And I hope we learned that lesson. What we are very bad at, George, is retreat. We are a horrible country when it comes to uh, leaving a, a situation of a vacuum. And I am completely embarrassed by the leadership in this country for what they did to uh, the American image, the Afghanistan image, and the, the, the blood that's going to be lost uh, within that border in the next six, seven, eight years. I... Uh am of like mind, Kevin. Um, the future looks very grim. Well, it's going to be bloodshed. But I'm also fearful that we're going to see in this country what we saw after the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. where popular opinion turned against the rank and file soldiers, the actual, the men on the ground who were fighting this war, and they were the villains, not the politicians who sent them there not the generals who told us all will be well, but the, the, the draftees and the young, young officers being lambasted as baby killers for carrying out a mission that they did very well, but they had a feckless government and a feckless media. When the South Viet, when the Viet Cong seized uh, in the Tet Offensive, when they seized Hue, we beat them back. But thanks to CBS News and Walter Cronkite, it was made a total disaster. And after uh, Wei felt at the end of the war, the communists came and massacred tens of thousands of people who had fought back. Mm. We're seeing the same sort of thing. It, actually, the Vietnamese ending was horrible, but it is not as horrible as what's happening in Afghanistan. Now, we are not, we do not have first-hand knowledge. And, but what we're seeing on the news media is absolutely in line with the history and our own sort of understanding of how these people's minds work of the door-to-door -door searches for let me see your iphone do you have a christian app in your iphone you do bam uh are you a folk singer are you have music you know bam you're dead homosexuals are being murdered now we see these photos of helicopters hold rising up into the sky with men dangling from ropes with ropes around their neck now I don't know who these men are. They could be thieves, murderers, and rapists whom the Taliban are getting tough with. 
it's more likely that they're soldiers formerly in the uh, Afghan Special Forces whom the Taliban are killing now that they've taken charge. Mm -hmm. um, the blame, there needs to be a reckoning. And I just pray that this country does not let itself be fooled again and blame the wrong people. We really need to ask our leaders, the generals who said this war could be won with just a few more bucks, the politicians who said that the Afghans are just like us and we're going to build a, a Vermont in Afghanistan of little town hall democracy, when nobody with any knowledge of that place and the culture and the religion believed that would be possible. Yeah. There needs to be a reckoning among the people who got us into this mess, not the people who actually did the hard work. Well, it's going to be inter very interesting for our international policy. You know, we, we've had a policy uh, that's gone back and forth. What is our intention in other countries as far as fighting uh, Nazism or fighting communism or fighting uh, militant Islam? What is our policy? Do we go when we're invited? Do we go there to, and, you know, George Bush went in there, uh, obsessively to prevent another 9-11 um, and, and help stabilize the country. Every time, you know, a country has gone in there and withdrawn, it, it's made worse. When the Soviet Union uh, uh, left, uh, largely because we helped train the, the Mujahideen uh, to fight them, uh, it, it was just a worse situation. Um, the Britons, when Britons left, it was a, a worse situation. It's a, it's a completely destabilized country and region. And now it's just going to be, uh, at least for a little while, 20 years, a pawn uh, between Iran, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, until something can happen. But it's not a country that you can... Just by its geographical nature, you can enter and in, 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 uh, invade, George. And also the larger geopolitical, it, you know, Vladimir Putin has long stated publicly that he doesn't think the Ukraine and the Baltic nations and Belarusia should be independent states. He wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Now, what if his army moved across the border to seize Belarus tomorrow? with the current disaster in our military hierarchy and in the State Department, this is the best time for him to do it. Well, it is. Should, is it, China about to move across to take Taiwan? Taiwan, easy target. Uh, Soviet Union can partially reconstitute. Um, uh, Gorbachev. North, is this the time for North Korea to get out all those tanks and missiles mm -hmm. and move against the South? You know, it, it's ironic that, you know, uh, Gorbachev said one of the reasons the Soviet Union fell is Afghanistan. It was just so demoralizing to our army. Uh, we put so many resources into it. Then Ronald Reagan, he put his Pershing missiles in Turkey that we couldn't fight that, you know. And so the Soviet Union, uh, you know, fell. And uh, it, it's interesting to see that that relationship now with Afghanistan is causing such uh, a turmoil that NATO does not have the power to defend uh, fellow countries. So, My wife's uh, stepfather was a colonel in the uh, Air Force, and I, he, he, he would jokingly say he spent his career on a runway at North Dakota waiting for the world to end. He uh, was a B-52 uh, pilot, then squadron leader, group leader. But the motto of the Strategic Air Command was peace through strength. and. I know in the sort of Dr. Strangelove world that would always be ridiculed, but it was actually did keep the peace. Okay. A strong military deterrent did keep wars from breaking out. Now, when there is no strong military deterrent, we now see, we'll see Iran move. We see, you know, what's going to happen in the Yemen, in the Gulf states, what's going to happen in, the, in India and Pakistan are going to come to, you know, are they going to start exchanging missiles? Kevin, you're absolutely right that the uh, the leadership uh, of our nation has just, I thought we vote should never be in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. But we both we both agree on that. Agree with that. But we need Once to get you're there, out. What do you it's do? How you, yeah. But it's how you do it mm -hmm. uh, that matters. And how this was done was just appalling. 
No. And uh, we're reading about Christians, they're starting to massacre Christians, yeah. Christian converts from Islam. Yeah, I mean, it's a story no. that I, I now here, I don't know if we're going to get to watch the story unfold unless we get a Republican in uh, office and they can blame the Republican for what's happening in Af Afghanistan. I, fi I, I think now the, the major uh, mainstream media is going to start to circle the wagons around Biden. Yeah, he, okay, was, this is horrible, but we can't keep this horrible up because uh, we got congressional elections come up in a, a, a year. Uh, after that, uh, there's going to be the presidential run. And we don't want that orange guy back. So, well, <laughs> and yeah. one, of the, one of the things about our government, and this is also true of the British government, Christians in Afghanistan, Christians in Syria, really receive low priority. Um, what it's turning out was that there was no systematic check of these people getting on airplanes out of Kabul. The, the media reported yesterday that one of the people who uh, turned up at a U.S. base in the United States actually had, was an Afghan who had been deported from the United States back to Afghanistan in 2017 after he was convicted of rape. This guy got on the plane, yet there are Americans who are working through the embassy. There are Afghan Christians. There are Afghan you know, women's rights leaders who are working through the system, and they couldn't get on because they were told or the gates were shut to them. But anybody who got over the fence uh, you know, at, or who was allowed by the Taliban to leave could go get on the planes. So you know, they're not checking they're not doing their job yeah. all this george is we're coming up in 10 days on the uh 20th anniversary of 9 11. yeah <laughs> i say it all the time and i'm not the first to say it it's a famous uh quote i was taught this by mr burroughs my freshman high school teacher uh in history he said uh history repeats itself he also said if is the biggest little word in the dictionary what would happen if what would happen if we never went into afghanistan what would happen if there was never a 9 11. you know what would america look like if there's no COVID? if all right george we have covered enough stories that people are going to leave comments for a long long time uh please go to the comment section i forgot to tell you guys to like the episode share the episode comment on the episode if you have not subscribed it's a great time to subscribe to the program I just found out with YouTube, when I get to 10,000 subscribers, which at this point looks like a long, long time from now, George, I can raise money as a not-for-profit through YouTube by putting a link on my channel. So guys, I think we're up about 7,000. I need the other 3,000 of you who have not subscribed to the show, just click subscribe. Just do it for a month or two. If you don't want to be subscribed, I understand. But just hold out until we get to 10, then you can unsubscribe so I can get my not-for-profit fundraising button on YouTube. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 683 of Anglican Unscripted.